Hello and welcome back to the Canadian Money Roadmap Podcast. I'm your host, Evan Newfield. Today, we're back in my summer series here where we'll have more frequent but shorter episodes on the topics of investing smarter and reducing taxes. Now with me in studio, or more specifically in my office here, I'm very lucky to be joined by Stephen Gunther, Certified Financial Planner, and my colleague here at Ensign Baxter Wealth Management. Stephen, thanks for coming. Thanks, Evan. Looking forward to the summer series. Last week, we talked about risk, and this week, we're going to be talking about something called asset allocation. Now, if there is jargon in any industry, ours is full of it. So what does asset allocation mean? Well, with investing, you have a number of different asset types. And so you have to make the decision of where you're going to allocate your capital or where you're going to put your money within those asset types. Are you going to put them all in one asset type? Are you going to spread it in differing parts to different types of assets? And based on your objectives, try to pursue or weight higher some asset classes over some others. And some examples of those asset classes, the big ones that we often hear about, stocks, bonds, or we might go back and say equities, Fixed income, if we're looking to add a little bit more jargon here, cash is another one. What are some other ones that people might have that maybe they're not really even thinking about? Real estate, they may own a house or have a rental property, farmland. You could have exposure to commodities, have exposure to private equity, currencies and other. I mean, especially nowadays, we hear a lot about cryptocurrency. It's another asset class. Even precious metals like gold and silver, copper. Those are all asset classes. Right. So I think we're going to keep to the the main ones here. But if you're looking at someone's personal portfolio, if you will, or someone's personal balance sheet, what about things with like four wheels, vehicles, RVs, things like that? If someone has a really high allocation to depreciating assets like that, that could be problematic too. But we'll, (laughs) we'll maybe stick with the appreciating assets or assets that we're hoping will increase in value over time. When we talk about asset allocation, again, it's that mix between the things that you own that you hope to achieve a certain goal over a period of time. So when we talk about assets and the potential for return, this pairs pretty well with the conversation we had last week on risk. So how much risk you're willing to take should be reflected in the asset allocation that you have. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And depending on the objective, it doesn't always, usually there's correlations like age, for example, is a good one. Usually the older you are, the less risk you're taking on because your goals are more short term in nature. You don't have as much time on your side, but that's not always true. I mean, you could be a young person saving for a house. It doesn't mean you should be have all of your money in private equity or, <laughs> or equities in general, for example, which carry higher levels of risk. But the, the concept of asset allocation ties in with risk. And the idea there is we're trying to achieve something called diversification anytime we invest. And so one of the ways we do that is by splitting up our capital into different asset classes. Because depending on your asset class, there's different levels of correlation between those asset classes. So correlation effectively means when the stock market goes up, for example, what are the other asset classes doing? Are they also going up? That's what we would call positive correlation. Let's say let's use a real example here. Say stocks in the US go up, do Canadian stocks go up at a similar rate? They're correlated but not perfectly. That's right. So they're they're going to move independently a little bit, but they're going to move up and down relatively similarly. Think of last year during COVID, both the Canadian stock market and the US market had that big correction, you could call it. Some might call it a crash. And then the subsequent gain steadily over time. Again, the stock market takes the elevator down and the stairs back up. We could kind of see that in both Canada and the US. But what about something like bonds at the same? You look at different periods and it's there's different levels of correlation, but the, the important part is when you're trying to create diversification that you want to pair non-correlated assets that are still positive, positively returning. So for example, the, the conventional balanced portfolio is 60% equities, 40% bonds. And that is because if you look historically, not over all time periods, but historically bonds are potentially even negatively correlated at times with equities. Negative <clears throat> correlation means if stocks go down, bonds go up? That's correct. Yeah. So you've got this this balancing effect. So if you have 40% of your portfolio in bonds and 60% in equities, the theory goes that when stocks are down, the bonds will hold up the portfolio. When bonds are not doing as well or paying low yield, 
your, your equities are usually doing pretty well. Interest rates are low. There's a, it's kind of a positive environment for equities. So that's the that's the thesis there is that if you blend the two together, they're non-correlated or even potentially negatively correlated, which will provide a smoother run and allow you to not have as much of that downside, both from an emotional standpoint, but from a portfolio standpoint, you won't experience as much downside. Right. And so even though you might be comfortable with the movements of the stock market day to day over time, you might realize, well, I'd prefer to have a little bit more of a smoother ride here. And so instead of having a really bumpy ride with having all equities or all stocks, you could potentially include some other asset classes to help smooth out the ride. That's kind of what you're getting at. And a, a good example we've seen historically, and this happened again with COVID, the COVID crash of 2020, is the people always flock to safe assets in times of crisis. So a good example, and a safe, perpetual safe asset is gold. So you can see... Whether that's a real thing or just another type of speculation is another conversation, maybe. Yeah. You, you see this movement towards perceived safe assets like gold, like cash. I mean, that's probably the best one caches but you will find that gold is sometimes negatively correlated with the stock market because you have when when times are good the economy's ripping everybody wants to get into into stocks when times are bad there's crisis people are selling their stocks and getting into things like gold they feel like that has more yeah intrinsic or perpetual whatever word you want to use value that's the last thing which is kind of ironic again based on what it actually is but <laughs> There, you mean, cash you mean is, that shiny rock is yeah. going to have value when the world ends? I mean, cash is the ultimate safe asset because there's no there's no return, there's no risk per se. It's the base level of value that we can use within our economy for transactions. But the challenge there is, of course, it's subject to inflation. So you don't want to also hold a bunch of cash. I mean, this is the challenge with with asset allocation is you have to have an appropriate mix for your objective. It involves diversification and appropriate level of risk for your objective. And there's kind of several layers there, but the idea is your asset allocation has to match your goals and has to be diversified within those asset classes as well. So if somebody is trying to figure out how much they should have, like, okay, my goal is this, now what? There are various tools that your uh, financial advisor, your financial planner, or your self-directed broker, or robo-advisor even, they would have questionnaires that you could fill out that would ask you a variety of questions about how you feel about risk, your current financial situation and timeline, and then it'll kind of spit out an answer at the end that say, okay, this might be an appropriate mix for you based on that. I think the conventional family will have maybe a home, two incomes, some kids want to retire one day, they they come to a financial advisor or they're doing it on their own and they want to know, okay, what kind of asset mix is, is suitable for retirement maybe 30 years from now? Well, there's a number of things in, in that example, but so we've got time on our side and time's good because it's the opposite of gambling. The more you play, as in the longer time you have, the higher the likelihood you're going to you're going to win. And you're going to have a gain. Whereas gambling is the opposite. The more you play, the more chance the house is going to win <laughs> naturally. Right. Or the the because the odds are known. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. you're going to get back to the the average, right. which is a loss, of course. So we have time on our side when we're investing for retirement. Then you move down the chain. Okay, what's our objective? Well, we don't need any income from this investment. We we're just putting it aside, leaving it for thirty years. So then our main objective is growth. Have the money grow over time. So there's a large pot there when we're ready to use it. And then the third thing is your risk tolerance, which it comprises both the psychological components and then also the capacity components. But those three categories will start the conversation on what types of assets are suitable. So naturally, the longer the time you have, the higher the risk tolerance that you have. And the, the more growth-based of an objective you have, the more aggressive you can be with your asset allocation. And you can do this on a line. You can plot different asset classes based on the relative risk level. So you've got cash, let's say on the far left side. And then, I mean, you can pick your poison on the far right. <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's Bitcoin on the far right. Yeah, let's put Bitcoin there. Highly speculative asset, super volatile. But anything in between, you can plot asset classes. And naturally, the more time you have, the more risk tolerance you have, the more suitable asset classes towards the right of the continuum would be within your given portfolio. That doesn't necessarily mean they should have 100% in that asset class, but it's the likelihood that you could consider including it. 
But naturally, your allocation will be determined by those three categories. And so depending on, you may not play in the far right end. I know many of our clients, are, we're, we're not touching a lot of that stuff in the far end of the spectrum. We're staying to more of the mainstream. So stocks, stocks. bonds, real estate, commodities, more of the middle of the road type, uh, more mainstream asset classes that most people are familiar with. And that, for the most part, usually allows people to reach their, their retirement goals, for example. So the weightings between those is where we would probably get more involved in trying to help position a portfolio in accordance with somebody's goals. Right. And so then to keep things simple, like I don't mean this podcast to make things more complicated, but like once people know what your approximate allocation should or might be to find an appropriate investment that matches that is a lot easier than it once was. Actually, most mutual fund companies, most ETF providers will have something called an asset allocation fund or ETF, depending on your different risk profile. So some might include 20% bonds and 80% stocks, or it might be a 50-50 mix or you know anywhere along that line. But if you're looking for something really easy, the products are out there. So you can talk to your financial planner, your advisor. You can do some Google searching and find some options that will be kind of like a one-stop shop for different asset allocation, depending on what your goals are. Okay, Stephen, I think that's it for the asset allocation episode. So to invest smarter, you should have a good idea of what your asset allocation should be, and then find an investment that matches your profile to make sure that you don't have unnecessary risk in your portfolio. Thanks for joining me today on the Canadian Money Roadmap Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, I'd really appreciate if you left me a review on Apple Podcasts with your biggest takeaway. If you have questions or ideas for topics you'd like me to discuss on future episodes, please reach out via my contact info in the show notes. This podcast is intended to be educational in nature and you should always consult your financial, tax, and legal advisors before making changes to your financial plan. Any rates of return discussed are historical or hypothetical and are to be used for educational purposes only. Evan Neufeld is a qualified associate financial planner and registered investment fund advisor. Mutual funds are provided through Sterling Mutuals, Inc.